Hey, I'm Bill Dutton. I see a lot of new faces here. Very want to welcome you, and uh, this is a sort of a bittersweet moment, I think, because we, uh, first of all, we're always delighted when Ted Nelson is speaking at the OII, and he always brings uh, people who are not necessarily uh, regulars to the OII, but uh, it's wonderful to have you here. Uh, but it's also an, a sad occasion because Ted is uh, going back to the States at the, after the, at the end of the month uh, with Marlene, and uh, we'll miss uh, both Marlene Malikat and Ted Nelson. Uh, I, always, I always think of Ted for the first time I read his work uh, when in, back in 74 when I was doing research on this social impacts of the internet, of the <laughs> computing and telecommunications. We didn't have the term internet at that time. Um, but it was um, it, Computer Lib and Dream Machines, the book that was uh, so exciting and got so many people interested in uh, the potential of computing. And, uh, but if you ask Ted, and, and as all of you who know Ted, you realize that he never talks about that. He's always talking about his what he's doing lately, you know. <laughs> Most academics, you have to push them to say, what are you doing, what have you done lately? <laughs> Ted is always working on the next thing. And uh, it's always been great to have him at the OII. He always forces us to think about how the web could be better, how the internet could have been better, uh, and that kind of uh, analytical skepticism about what we take for granted as, as uh, uh, the way in which the web or the internet should work, has, will work, uh, is, is uh, something he brings to the OI. We'll miss that. Uh, hopefully you'll continue to be involved with the OII, even from the States, and that we'll get you back on occasion. Sure. But, uh, now I will get out of the way. We have two hours, I believe. Yeah. But we have a reception at 5 o'clock, and so hopefully we can have informal discussion. At the end, if we have, if we have time for questions, uh, we do have, we'll have a mic, and so we'll pass that around. Okay, Good. Ted, thank, thank you very much. Well, I want to thank everybody, first of all, Bill, the OII, my, especially my partner, Marlene, and a uh, whole lot of friends in Nottingham, Southampton, and here in Oxford for everything that's going on, uh, and our colleague Rob Smith, who's the lead programmer in what we're doing now. But this is going to be, this is going to be, this is going to be kind of a, this talk will be different because over the last decades, I've had to speak in the voice of a social scientist or the voice of a computer guy, and it's never the big picture. And the, very, the big picture is very big. And having to narrow it to the context of particular academic disciplines is, um, narrowing to the mind. I'm just, going to talk to, I'm just going to talk about what I've tried to be and what I've tried to do over the years and why I'm still doing it. I never had any identity problem. When I was 14, I typed up a little card that said, Ted Nelson, Nexialist. I had found the word in a book called The Voyage of the Space Beagle, a science fiction novel by A.E. Van Vogt, and he defined Nexialist as someone who finds connections. I've been tracking on that. Then two years later, when I was 16, I signed up for a speed reading course, and they handed me a form to fill out that asked my occupation. Well, I was damned if I was going to say student. So I thought a little, and I wrote, poet, philosopher, and rogue. <laughs> and apparently I'm still tracking on that as well. <laughs> a few years ago, I got a medal in Paris, and to my astonishment, the, um, the Minister of Culture said, vous êtes philosophe et poète. Wow, how did she know? Had she been in touch with the speed reading company? <laughs> <clears throat> So I'll try to throw in a little philosophy and poetry. The roguery perhaps is diffuse. I don't feel like a rogue so much as trying to make people see the truth 
And that seems roguish to some. I was raised by my grandparents and my great-grandparents. My grandparents were very literary, and they uh, helped me enlarge my vocabulary as fast as my little mouth could run. And uh, my great-grandfather, a retired science teacher, told me about uh, the Doppler shift and the precession of the equinoxes and astronomy and all kinds of things. And the more I learned, the more I wanted to know. And I asked questions all day long, and they answered them all day long. Very few children have that privilege of people who are willing, let alone able, to give first order answers to all the questions of a child. I remember when I was visiting in rural Georgia in 1963, and some child asked, gee, I wonder how far away the stars are, and his mother said, oh, how you do go on with your silly questions. And that made me very sad. Now, that was my grandparents. My, my parents were young actors who were divorced when I was born. My grandfather made them stay married until I was born so that I would be legitimate, which was a legitimate concern in those days. And from them, who I saw from time to time, obviously separately, I learned many things. <clears throat> my mother was on Broadway and later in films, and so we got to see, we got to, I got to go backstage on Broadway, meet a few famous actors, and, uh, and see the Fox Lot. I think I still have the pictures I took of the Fox Lot, uh, the late lamented Fox Lot in uh, L.A. when I was 12. And uh, my father, both of my parents were very hard-driving and very talented and clever, uh, though neither was intellectual in any sense. And uh, my father wrote a hit play on Broadway while he was a flight instructor in the state of Georgia, which is pretty good. It was Kirk Douglas's first part. And when my father got out of the Army, because the Air Force was still in the Army at the time, he entered a new field called television. And I got to sit behind him in control rooms. Now, the control room was very interesting. You see, it had a big window looking out on the studio. So you saw part of the set, and, uh, but you were acoustically isolated. And my father had a, uh, an intercom. When he had been at NBC, the director was not allowed to talk to the cameraman. I've met, I sat with somebody on an airplane in the late 90s, and I mentioned this, and he said, yep. That rule was just changed 40 years <laughs> later. <laughs> so <clears throat> that was the principal reason my father left NBC, and then he was directing at CBS, where he was able to talk to the cameraman if he needed to, and I was sitting behind him that night when camera one went out. Camera one was the big one, the one that went up and down. <clears throat> and my father had to talk the show through. Okay, camera two to the kitchen, camera three to the front porch, camera two to the front porch, camera three to the kitchen. And he did this seamlessly. When it was over, the control room erupted in applause. The producers, the, the, the lighting guys, the, every, everybody there, because he had saved the show. And it wouldn't have been fa his fault if he hadn't. <laughs> but uh, you couldn't do that at CBS, but he had the presence of mind. He, was, he had both the military orientation and a showbiz orientation. So the main thing I learned was that new media are born. Television was being invented. So, for example, the month or the year they invented split screen, NBC got a patent on split screen, which meant that the scan lines from two different sources could be broken in the middle, so you'd have a picture from one camera on the left, a picture from one camera on the right. Trivial now. This was a big deal in 1949 or 50. So my father had a show. He had a weekly heartwarming family comedy show called Mama. <clears throat> on one of the shows, he had Mama and her, on one of the aunts talking on the phone, and they, it was split screen. And immediately he got a call from his friend at NBC saying, how did you do that? Well, of course, the actresses were standing six inches apart. 
<laughs> this was, he was also a prankster. <clears throat> after, after, um, after each dress rehearsal, there were what were called producer's notes. And that meant that the producer or the producer's representative came and bothered the director with a long list of junky fixes that he wanted put in before the actual show, which would be two hours later. And that would mean sitting with the actors and going through them all they would promise to do and blah, 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 blah. So, <clears throat> uh, from, from sources I've seen, this is still a nuisance. So my father would always play a prank in the dress rehearsal, sometimes a little one, sometimes a big one. He had me on a show uh, in the summer of 58, on a shipboard romance it was. I was just a walk-on, but... Uh, at the end, under the closing titles, he showed the Andrea Doria sinking, implying that the whole ship had sunk and obviously changing the story somewhat. So he then started his stopwatch, as he liked to do when he played his prank, to see how long it would take the producer's representative to reach him, <laughs> and, then, and then would allow himself we allow the producer to represent, represent it to plead him out of this, uh, this uh, inspiration for five or ten minutes until finally he would agree not to do it, after which all the other notes were forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a very, very useful technique. Anyway, so, so new media were born. They were changing all the time. And this was obvious because, of course, even in the 20th century, we'd had telephony, well, that was before the turn of the century, and, and the others, but movies and telephones and radio all grew to their new height in the 20th century, and television was just one more of these. And then, the, then at the same time, 47, 48, 49, out came the long playing record, which then which changed the, uh, which went back to a previous recording standard of 33 RPM, and out came the 45 RPM single, and uh, competing with one another. So all of these things were changing. It was perfectly familiar to me. Now, you could say I was always a, a bit sophisticated. For example, when I was 10, I could have told you who had coined the words chortle, tintinabulate, serendipity, and I wanted to know everything about words. I wanted to know every word in the language. Of course, that's systematically impossible. But uh, I wanted to know everything about every subject. And I didn't accept the way things were taught or explained. Now, wanting to, be, wanting to know everything is perhaps a youthful attitude. Perhaps it's a way to keep on looking young. Perhaps a way to live forever. I don't know. But where will you learn everything? Surely not in school. In my harsher moments, I used to speak of schools as a system for systematically destroying people's minds. I would amend that and say, for systematically aligning people's minds so they all think alike. This helps communication. It fosters the ability to work together. And it crumples originality. It crumples the ability to see and observe. By the time I was 11 or 12, I was embittered. I was... I didn't like middle-class life and putting on a show. We had an elevator in our apartment building. You had to sort of stand facing front and talk about the weather. I thought this was so artificial and awful. And I thought there would be better ways to live. There, surely there'd be better equipment to live. One of my first, first things I sent for when I was five or six was a projector gun. I was so excited, I thought I'd have a whole movie theater, and it was this little dopey thing that, that, that had 16 millimeter film on it and a double-A battery. <clears throat> it was hugely disappointing. Then when I was, uh, I guess, seven or eight, I became enthralled by a product called Kangaroo Spring Shoes. They had long springs. <laughs> And obviously this would allow me to take great leaps and to go down the block at double the speed. So I put them on and immediately sprained both ankles very badly. Uh, later in graduate school, partly inspired by 
Disney's movie Make Mine Music, which had a character named Bongo the Bear, who rode around, I think it was Make Mine Music, rode around on a unicycle. I thought, that's the way, that's so much more practical than a bicycle. So in graduate school, I bought a unicycle, and it's preposterously hard to ride, <coughs> and, uh, and you can't carry anything. And uh, <coughs> it, was, it was a, well, I wouldn't say it was a mistake, it was a learning experience. But it was, uh, you know, I later, when I first visited Doug Engelbart, one of the people in his office uh, persuaded me that skateboards were the way to go. So I got a skateboard when I was 40 and uh, learned to do that a little bit. And that wasn't very practical either. I keep looking for the, 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 the they now have electric skateboards. She won't let me get one. <laughs> They have a remote, would you believe? <laughs> so you stand there, you, you stand there uh, in a fencing position, one, 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 uh, one uh, foot facing forward, one foot facing sideways with the remote in your hand. And it has, as you know, electric vehicles have tremendous acceleration. Uh, so, uh, anyway. When I was 10, one of my great heroes was Frank Lloyd Wright. Still is. And I heard about his house, Falling Water, which is built around a stream. And I was just thrilled by this. I thought the stream went through the living room. I only found out a couple of years ago, nah, it just goes around it. <coughs> uh, but, uh, but it was, so I was very disappointed. But from that, I got to thinking about having an underwater house and getting all enthralled about that. So it, it's always seemed to me that things would be so much better if they were different. Now that, the, 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 the ratio of change to improvement there is, the, is what's to be considered. <clears throat> Movies were my religion. When I was little, we lived in Chicago, right next to our block from the Esquire Theater, which is still standing as one of the great Art Deco palaces. And there I saw the first run of Bambi, second run of Snow White, first run of Fantasia, and uh, a couple of others. And Disney was my god. And I think he's now considerably underrated in the, in the backlash. But studying movies and the effects and how they were made, I thought about it all the time. When I was 15, I got my own copy of the American Cinematographer Handbook. And that was about the year of a film called when Worlds Collide. When Worlds Collide is, was incredibly moving to me because it told of a perilous moment where the Earth is about to be hit by a great celestial object. Well, this was considered fantastical then. Now we know it happens from time to time. In fact, it was going to be hit by two. The first one would be the warning, which would cause tidal waves, and the second would destroy the planet. And so a crash course, a crash project is, is, is created to create a breeding planet, a, a breeding population off the planet. We must escape. And the calendar is a character in this movie. Every day the page turns one day closer to the end. And there's a great effect where they flooded Times Square in the... Um, in the as the first planet went by. How did they do this? Well, they made a miniature Times Square of all the shapes of the buildings. They painted the blocks, they painted the blocks of these buildings black. Then they released a large amount of water, I think it's probably the size of this room, into that space. Photographing it as they went, speeding up the camera so that the ratio of the movement of the water to the space would be correct when the film was appropriately slowed down. Then they made masks, a male and a female mask, for films of actual Times Square showing the cars, so that, and showing the cars on the buildings, so that it would appear as though, when they printed these together in a sandwich, it would appear as though the water were obscuring the cars and the buildings. I tell you that in summary simply to say that <clears throat> this was what I was studying. This was my deepest interest. How do you do these things? If you had asked me at, say, at 15, if you told me about the Matrix cam, all right, in the Matrix cam, somebody leaps in the air and then the camera goes around them frozen. I'm not going to tell you how to do that. It's easy. <laughs> you couldn't, it wouldn't be electronic and it wouldn't be digital, but 
All you need is a whole bunch of cameras and one strobe. So the point is that uh, uh, when you start to think like this, the relation of action to framing, to presentational structure, you're thinking like a director. You're thinking about how it all fits together and what is the purpose. The purpose is the effect on the mind and heart of the viewer. And the mechanism you choose to affect the heart and mind of the viewer, ah, these are the director's prerogative and the budget's constraints. So, I went to college and I took charge. You see, they have this thing called the curriculum, this traditional thing called the curriculum. And that is exactly what's wrong with education in my mind. People try to create better curricula. They're just going around the same, same problem. Because what does curriculum mean? It means, in Latin, racetrack. And you're creating a racetrack where you are assigning the things to be learned to a timetable. which is probably not optimal. Now, curricula are also products of political fighting. So that creating a new curriculum is a tremendous thing of committee fights and blah, 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 but why have it at all? The objective is education, yes? What is the best way to get people educated is to motivate them. What is the best way to take away motivation? The curriculum. What is the right order in which to learn history? I ask rhetorically, and obviously the answer is any way at all is fine. So perhaps the right order is the way the person wants to, is the order in which the person is interested. Because it's far more interesting that way. How many people do you know who say they hated history in school and then found out later how interesting it was? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I didn't ask you to show me that, but it came anyway. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so, history, so uh, school is a system for ruining different subjects for you, and the last subject to be ruined determines your profession. <laughs> so why should this be? So take history. See, I'm not arguing for the Summerhill guitars on the lawn thing. I'm saying, let's create testable requirements, but allow the student to choose the order, manner, sequence, style in which it shall be learnt. Now you see, one of the problems there is that an important function of the curriculum is to keep the academic persons occupied so they can be paid and to utilize the buildings optimally, and to keep all the secretaries busy. And where would we be without all that? I don't know. I think <coughs> it has to start with an experimental school in California, obviously. <coughs> but it can be done. Anyway, so when I went to college, uh, they had this thing of requiring a major. Well, in my first two years, I tried about five different majors, obviously, no, I was not interested in English literature, it turned out, nor in psychology. And they didn't teach sociology, so that retained for me a romantic fascination because I thought that would be where the truth would lie. Ended up in philosophy. But I took courses in the hot new stuff that nobody knew about in the standard curricula. Uh, Whorf's, the Whorfian hypothesis had just come out then that, that, uh, that, uh, Language affects our thinking, and because it wasn't taught, it was much more romantic and exciting, and I, I, I managed to get a reading course in that, and uh, uh, anthropology stuff. So I managed to cover a lot of different things before I settled down, and after that I majored in extracurriculars, because I figured this was the one opportunity I would have to do all kinds of stuff that would be very difficult outside. So I managed in my college years to produce a long playing record, to write the first rock musical, um, 
Here's the, here's the program for it. Printed just 50 years ago this year. Um, I wrote to, the, um, to some auction house in London that claims to sell rock memorabilia online and said, can we monetize the last two virgin copies of the LP? And uh, they didn't even reply. Not, not canonical, not on the list. <laughs> so, yeah, I produced an, a long playing record, and then finally, a movie. Oh, let me, let me, let me show you bits of that. <clears throat> I'm rather proud of it. It came about in a strange way. My roommate, Tony Poole, and I were going to, uh, we managed to get a $700 grant from the student council to make a film, and we started wrangling about the script. <laughs> he would write it, I would direct it, but then what he was planning to write didn't suit what I wanted to do, but anyway, we were arguing about it, and then abruptly, he died. And this was a terrible shock, he's my best friend, and so I shelved the project. But then, a few weeks before finals, when one is looking for things to do, <laughs> <laughs> It occurred to me, I had 700 bucks to make a movie. He would have wanted me to. No time to write a script. Mm. <laughs> okay, I'll make it up as I go along. And since we'd be fitting the soundtrack on afterward, I'll just have the actors say, parp, parp, parp. And that'll be funny, like Huckleberry Hound. Well, I like what I did, and it's very atmospheric, but a lot of people can't relate to the parp, parp, parp. <laughs> I was thinking I'd put it on the net and, ma and make it seem as if it were scanned at a very low rate. So I'll just run a couple of pieces of that while we talk. So it was atmospheric, and the interesting thing was that a character emerged out of it and a, uh, uh, that, that wasn't me and it wasn't the actor. It was somebody else. Very, a nice character, a character you like. So, the other thing I started doing in college was taking notes, taking serious notes. Because, <laughs> I'll, let it, I'll just let it run for a minute. <laughs> Stand over here so you don't look at me. <laughs> the, the other thing I started doing in college was, was uh, taking serious notes. Because I, I saw that other people vaguely remembered things and half remembered things and were all wrong about lots of facts. And I said, I don't want to be that way. I want to get things right. I want to remember things correctly. And so uh, I started taking serious notes on every subject that interested me. Little knowing what, where, where this would go. So by the end of college, I had, oh, that many notes <laughs> on four by six cards. Little did I know. And I've gone on doing that because it's a way of putting stakes in the ground for learning different subjects. If you remember one thing, that's more than remember nothing, remember, remembering nothing. And if you remember several things about a field, well, that begins to be a little something of an impression. It's, it may be trivial. But it's as much as lots of other people know about the field. And from time to time, I've been very pleased that I knew things other people didn't. One time I actually ta told a master of an Oxford college something he didn't know about his own field. So uh, this is a pleasure and it's fascinating to know things. It's just fascinating. But the more you know, the greater the boundary of the unknown. So you never feel like you know everything. It's exactly the opposite. Knowledge is fractal. There are big lumps and little lumps, and they're all shaped the same with uncertainty at every edge. Information is fractal. Disagreement 
is fractal. The whole world of ideas is this whole bunch of stuff that doesn't have any structure. People put hierarchy on it since Aristotle because it's convenient or because they want to. But the actual structure of the ideas goes in all directions. And that is the fascinating part. Now, for example, I'll uh, kill this. Now, I'm going to sing you a song from the, from the musical because it's so, I, I only noticed lately how well it expresses academic mores. <clears throat> this is a content-free song <laughs> about a content-free uh, uh, seminar paper. <coughs> it can be seen as looked upon from different points of view. It can be seen as looked upon from different points of view. I will try to clarify this and thereby to verify this to whatever small extent I may be able to so do. Ooh, ooh. This outlook in the setup of the concepts I express shows a tendency to take us in an infinite regress. Since the framework of the viewpoint somehow seems to have dissolved the bifurcated status of dichotomies involved, it can be seen, etc. <clears throat> the division of the subject is connoted by the way that the categories here may lead the neophyte astray. So let me state a fact the which you yet may know not of, as I have stated earlier in what I said above. It can be seen as looked upon from different points of view. It can be seen as looked upon from different points of view. I think that I have proved it in a manner that behooved it, and in doing so have shown that I was able to so do. Ooh, ooh. <clears throat> From, <laughs> starting from that basis of understanding, I should have known better than to try to get into academia because that expresses, I think, far too well many aspects of the academic world as I still know it. But the problem is that the truth is out there and some of it is known <laughs> by scholars. <laughs> and uh, one can't quite stay away. Now, the same year I wrote, the same in my junior year, I wrote that musical, and uh, by the way, just, just for credit, uh, the songs, the, the tunes were written by Richard Kaplan, but essentially to my spec. <laughs> uh, but I wrote and directed it, and it was much too long, and unfortunately, the cast outnumbered the audience. <laughs> Having 75 people in the cast was not intelligent. <clears throat> The second main thing I did that year is I wrote a, I became wildly inspired. I got philosophically inflated with what I can now state as the insight that everything can be expressed in terms of graph structure. Now I'd never heard of graph structure, didn't hear of it that year either. But I tried to put this into a, I did put this into a term paper, which is uh, reprinted in my PhD thesis, <laughs> which uh, endeavored to solve all the philosophical problems and create a generalized representational structure for all ideas, and therefore happened to be at exactly the same time as the other knowledge representation work that I knew nothing about at the time. <laughs> so it was of its time, though independently uh, 
inspired. And I've gone on thinking about that stuff. I can't get it out of my mind. The way I've developed it has had very little to do with the way it's developed in the academic community. And uh, I don't know when or whether I will ever have a chance to write it up and publish it because it's extremely difficult. So in 1959, when I was graduating from college, I was in a quandary. I couldn't choose between show business and intellect. And as I said, I was unaware of the things that I would really hate about academia, which would have put me off. But I believed I could analyze anything, I could design anything, and I could show anything. My father had offered to help me become an actor, but I, I didn't think I had the talent. And at the same time, I made this little movie, and I thought, wow, that's what I'm best at. That's what I want to do. But there's still stuff I've got to know. So I went to graduate school. And that, that was extremely horrible. My, I, was at the, uh, I was at the University of Chicago for a year. Now, to encapsulate it, the temperature is roughly 10 below much of the winter. The university has 1,000 women and 11,000 men. And uh, the experience was quite horrible. <coughs> Second year, I went to Harvard, and I took a course in computers. Now, I asked rhetorically, with your heart in show business and your head in academia, what do you do? Answer, you invent hypertext and hypermedia. <laughs> <laughs> because I looked at them, they were presenting this thing as a calculating engine and then saying, well, we can also do text analysis with it. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. A program can do anything, and you can put a screen on it. That's it. That's it. That's the future of the human world. Human world. Human world. Human race. All of human work will go to the computer screen. Now, at this time, there were about under 100 computer screens in the world. Most of them had either NORAD or um, uh, you know, missile defense or uh, air, tra air traffic control. But at the same time, the principle was absolutely clear. Moore's law was in place. Moore's law was, had not been stated as such, but it was perfectly clear. So it's when I saw you could put, head, put screens on them, my head exploded. This was the future of the human race, a different kind of life Self-publishing. See, I hated publishers. <laughs> I came from my grandmother self-published, my great-grandfather self-published. It seemed to me the right way to go. William Blake self-published. Hey, come on. The, 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 um, <clears throat> the, uh, I later worked for a big publisher, and they, they said, well, self-publishing is vanity publishing. Excuse me. All publishing is vanity publishing. <laughs> so I thought, since the computer screen is going to replace paper in every aspect, we must create an entire system an entire, complete new universe parallel to the old that takes care of versioning, publishing, annotation, publishing of marginal notes, and ways to sell content legitimately within the copyright system. I, I, later, in the, coming, in the decade after that, the decades after that, all the geeks have said, oh, well, copyright is over because we can make copies. That's like saying that life is over because we can shoot people. <clears throat> the, I had my own copyright certificates from my freshman year. There was no question. I knew people who lived by their writers. No question that copyright's going to go on politically. So how do we handle this in the most politically magnanimous 
gracious win-win system? And the answer seemed to me obvious. You pay, not for a whole book at a time, but for the next screen full that you send for. It. And who gets it? Well, obviously, the, some of it has to go to the service provider. Again, I was guessing as to what the form of transmission would be. But since there would be digital transmission, that was, that was assured. Since there would be digital transmission, some of it would go to pay for the digital transmission. And some would go to pay for the document to those who stored it and to those who created it. But instead of the, the book being the unit, now we would go to different units. But not only that, just the next screen full as you continued in the document. Now, what did that mean? It meant that you, it's like not buying wine by the glass, buying wine by the sip. It's just as valid a form of commerce. It's just very different. But what would that mean that was beneficial? It would simplify the problem of quotation and permission. I had already tried to get permission to reprint something and saw what a can of worms that was. So instead of having to negotiate permission to reprint or to reuse something, all you do in this postulated future system is you put a pointer in. If you wish to include something in your document from some other document, you put a pointer in that brings it in from the legitimate sales source of that piece. So it is seamlessly purchased by the user. It's absolutely fair. It all adds up. Nothing is delivered that isn't paid for. And the user gets to keep it. Now, I'm giving you a simplified view because this has gone through many different stages. But this has always been basically the idea. So now we're getting there, aren't we? We're keeping documents, but we're still doing them as whole units. Quotability is not yet on anybody's horizon, and that is the central problem. So legitimate quotability. Now people say, well, you've got, free, uh, you've got uh, fair use. What about that? Fair use is different. Fair use means you can use a certain amount, little bits. I'm talking about big bits. Big chunks. So the present version of this is called transcopyright. I have a patent on it, which I recently sold, but I retain the, uh, the rights to use it. And uh, this will allow the sale of content on the web with automatic payment to the rights holder, to many rights holders, as you go along. But the whole point was, you had to have a complete system that did all of this. You had to have ways of overlaying any document. Get back to this. So people would say to me, for the next two decades, they'd say to me, but are you a computer scientist? What has that got to do with it? <laughs> This is all obvious. And in fact, the computer scientists, a lot of them are clucks and <laughs> obsessed with completely unimportant things. What do they teach them? For, what, is, what is the tradition of teaching first in computer science? <clears throat> in computer science? Recursive programming, which is absolutely useless. But it's a way of saying, we're scientists here. We don't care if it's useful. <clears throat> <laughs> And the computer scientists I talked to in 1960 and after, they couldn't get it on their horizon that, we, that people would be reading and writing from screens. They'd say, oh, well, we'll, we'll look for relevance of, um, relevance of queries. That was one. That was, uh, what's his name at Harvard? And uh, I, I'm not saying this, this is illicit work. It's just that uh, it wasn't getting to what I thought was the center. And so every computer scientist I talked to about this during the 1960s came up with some bozoid response. <clears throat> and so uh, it's not about computer science. It's not about computer science. It's about documents. It's about civilization, for God's sake. It's about what kind of a civilization we're going to have. And right now, we're living. Calm down. So. 
So <clears throat> how could Nelson know this? He wasn't a, a, a computer scientist. I was a movie maker. What is the computer with a screen on it? It's a movie machine. It's a special effects box. <clears throat> okay, how do you do special effects? Well, you look at all the possibilities, with cameras, framing, da da da. What's the cheapest way to make a monster? Have a, have a picture of a person reacting, ah! <clears throat> okay, so these are all options. Now, what does, the, what does the computer do on the screen? It goes down a list of shapes and letters and puts them on the screen in the places you've specified. That's all it is, but entangled with further and further complications. So this is not a, a hard concept, or it wasn't a hard concept. For, it was a hard concept for a lot of people, but it really wasn't, you see. So it's no, it, this problem of putting documents on the screen was the, prob, the same problem as flooding times square. You figure out how to do it, and you do it. So I had been wondering what really was my destiny in life, and it became very clear. I had to design the documents of the future, because if I didn't, the techies would screw it up. And I believe that is exactly what has happened. And so now we live in a world of screwed up documents. So <clears throat> my plan was to, uh, was to build a company selling personal computer software, a plan that was nicely uh, carried out by Steve Jobs and later by Bill Gates. Uh, I was not able to get leverage, uh, partly because I couldn't uh, persuade anybody to help me because I didn't have a computer science degree, blah, blah, blah. Also, you see, I had a director's attitude. And that's not, that's still culturally unacceptable in the computer world. They say, well, programmers, they're the designers. Nah, come on. Very few programmers can, can design uh, systems for people. It's entirely different. It's entirely different ability. And the director is not acknowledged, except at Pixar. But most computer companies do not see, and most computer projects are run in this herding cats mode with nobody uh, taking a strong hand. And this is why they hate Steve Jobs, because he takes a strong hand. And that is why the Macintosh is so well designed and, the, <laughs> and Windows is such a can of worms because Steve Jobs takes a very strong hand in the design of stuff, his stuff, and Steve Jobs is a movie director. So, not that I use the Macintosh, nor, but I, let me point, point something else out. Jobs and Gates packaged the existing stuff. They packaged the prevailing paradigm. Hierarchical directories, short file names, Programs running on files. Um, then when Xerox PARC created today's modern GUI, better called the PUI or PARC user interface, they added windows and icons and desktop and clipboard. But they were packaging stuff that other people had created. Unfortunately, I was trying to create a different world myself and have done so but at great, great cost and with great, great difficulty because of the problem of getting leverage. I always thought, I have always thought that the Xanadu product would be ready in six months and that I would be making feature films in two years. And that has always been the plan. I never made another plan. I could tell you about the fights and the computer adventures. I'm writing a book called Geeks Bearing Gifts, How the Computer World Got This Way. To counter the myth of technology. By the myth of technology, I mean the myth that IT, information technology, is some sort of relentless force moving with its own steam according to determinate principles. Whereas, in fact, what we see here today, all that crap that's out there, is the result of passions and fights 
and packaging and conventions and could be entirely different, except that it isn't. The fact that Microsoft, well, let's look at, uh, let's look at this, the history of text systems to take a random example. Not random. By the way, <clears throat> I will tell you my greatest out outrage here. This was called cut and paste until 1984. When I learned to write in my teens, the fundamental axiom was writing is mostly rewriting and rewriting is cut and paste. Meaning, you cut the current version, you lay out the pieces and find a better order then you paste them down in that order. Now, I learned this when I was about 15. When I was 19, my first job was at my hometown newspaper called the New York Times. And I was a copy boy. And what, my first task in the morning was to fill the pots of paste. Uh, the, yesterday's pot of paste was full of crunchy old white flakes which had to be scraped out, and I would take it to this vat of gleaming colloid, which I would put in, and the, the, the paste pots had a little uh, tube up the center to accommodate the brush. So you had, it was difficult to put the paste in because you had to put into the annular hole around the tube. But that was a matter of pride for me. So I put two on the city desk, and I don't remember what the other desks were. And. Uh, then I'd sit around, and during the day, somebody would yell, copy. Well, first of all, they would type something up. They'd come in, sometimes wearing slouch hats, as in the movies, <coughs> and type something. And then some, sometimes they'd just say, copy, and I'd put it in the pneumatic tube to the next floor. And sometimes they'd say, copy, after they had cut it and pasted it a couple times. So that's the real cut and paste. Pardon me. Now I have to call it deep rearrange, because in 1984, the Macintosh came out, and they changed the meaning of the words cut and paste. So that cut meant hide this, and paste meant spit out whatever you're hiding, wherever, I'm po wherever you're pointing. And I've actually had Xerox PARC alumni. I, mean, I have friends from Xerox PARC, but I have rather a negative sentiment about the place. <clears throat> I've had Parkies say to me, well, it's the same thing. This is. Isn't it amazing how people can believe metaphysical things? Uh, like, like uh, how, uh, anyway, this is not the same thing as hide this piece with control C and uh, uh, control X and uh, paste this thing with control V. Not at all. This is a number of strips of paper <laughs> attached to a backing sheet. And to achieve the same effect, you see, the, the problem is being able to see all the pieces at once. The parallel viewing of all the portions of your work, one of the higher functions of the human mind, rather than hide and plug, as represented by these two functions. But what, why do they call it that, then? They call it because they created this abominable mechanism called the clipboard. And to justify it, they gave it the name clipboard. See, it's just like an ordinary clipboard, except you can't see it. It only holds one thing. And it just, if, when you put something on it, it destroys the previous contents. In every other way, it's exactly like a physical clipboard, except there aren't any other respects. <laughs> so this is pure propaganda to make you accept this abominable mechanism. And the, uh, so then they called the functions of it copy, uh, cut and paste, copy, cut and paste, to make it seem as though somehow it was replacing a previous function, which it does not do. And you cannot get software that allows you to do that. Now, I found a way, I, I, I use TextPad pulling from one, uh, from one co um, version to another, which doesn't do the same thing because it does not give you the overview. You want to be able to shrink the text, zoom in, zoom in around, crawl around, and pull it across. OK. End of that sermon. So here is the history of text systems from my point of view. Make that a little larger. Right. Sorry about the cruddy slide. I did this in Leipzig last week. <clears throat> there are basically four people I'd like you to note. 
Doug Engelbart, myself, John Siebold, and um, Bob, Taylor. Bob Taylor. Right. So Doug Engelbart is the great visionary of the computer field. In 1957, he had his great epiphany. By the way, both Doug and I read an article called As We May Think, which was published in 1945 by um, Van Nivar Bush, who was the President Roosevelt's science advisor. And Bush talked about what he called the Memex, which would be a box that would hold all of mankind's writings. And of course, it would all fit in microfilm under your desk. <coughs> but you'd be able to make trails of the different significant objects and side trails commenting on them. And Doug was inspired by this, and I think I was inspired by it. But since it came out when I was eight, I'm not dead sure. <clears throat> now, it has been taken as the beginning of hypertext. Well, I, I won't get to that one. OK, so I should have had that up here. So Doug Engelbart was thinking about all these things. And in 1957, he had a vision of people being able to share work, share work on screens, share documents on screens, <coughs> and he saw this as, quote, raising collective IQ, meaning the ability of people to work together because the whole group is smarter. Whereas I've always believed that the IQ of a group was less than the IQ of any person. But <clears throat> he, at, Stanford, at Stanford Research Institute, not part of Stanford University, he got grants from this guy, Bob Taylor. He got grants and built something called NLS, which stood for online system. He invented, as everyone knows, the mouse. But that was only for one hand. In the other hand, using Doug's system, under the other hand, you had a five finger keyboard. So Doug still works on his NLS system with a mouse in one hand and the five finger and typing with the other uh, seamlessly, not having to move to, the, to a regular keyboard, regular QWERTY keyboard. Unfortunately, well, we'll see what happened. So I had my ideas in 1960, which were entirely different. What I called, I came up with the word hypertext about here in 1963. But to me, it meant something very different from what is now called hypertext. It meant being able to buckle documents <laughs> side by side. It meant marginalia. It meant uh, publishing mechanisms, an entire suite, an entire suite. I'm, I believe. You can have the paperless office. It's a commonplace joke that, oh, no, you can't have the paperless office. Paperless office like the paperless toilet. Oh, no. But <laughs> anyone who compares paper, uh, an office to a toilet shouldn't be designing software. <clears throat> the, uh, the point is, I believe you can replace, have a paperless office, but not if you imitate paper. Get it? <laughs> if you imitate paper. It's hopeless. <laughs> it's uh, totally inferior to the way things are now. <laughs> and uh, oh my. OK. So the third party of special interest is John W. Siebold. John was a, Qua a Quaker and a, he also a fellow Swarthmore graduate. Uh, he was a peacemaker. Quakers are peacemakers. And they know how to find the good in everyone. And, and John was a very nice man and was a labor negotiator and worked more and more in the printing and publishing industry and got to know that. After which, in 1963, he visited a printing plant in Florida and he had his epiphany, which was that you could typeset by computer. Because up to this time, everything had to be re-typeset every time. Every time you wanted to publish a Bible in a different font, it had to be keyed in again. Uh, and he naturally saw something wrong with that. And he created a company called Rocapi in the 60s. It stood for, research, I think, Research on Computer Applications in Printing Publishing Industry. Uh, and uh, became the, essentially, hon honcho of fonts. Now over here is Bob Taylor. Bob Taylor was at ARPA which was the Defense Department uh, Advanced Research Projects. The Defense Department was basically what the Army wanted, what the Navy wanted, what the Air Force wanted, and ARPA. <laughs> so those three services had their own 
missions in mind and were fighting with each other, ARPA was supposed to look ahead. ARPA IPT put up the money for Doug Engelbart, they put up the, uh, the money for the internet when it was just a gleam in somebody's eye, and a lot of other stuff. Now, this is incorrectly represented in the presses as always having sinister intent. Not at all. They were just trying to find the hot buttons. They backed <laughs> Ivan Sutherland's, Sutherland's original sketch pad. They backed lots of things with no rem remotely military application that just might come in handy someday, and of course have. Some, some of them. Many have not. But you don't know. You've got to kiss a lot of frogs before you find your prince, as the saying goes. And so <clears throat> one of the frogs was Doug Engelbart. And the, uh, pardon me, that's, uh, I love him dearly. He just got married. <clears throat> He's a wonderful guy. So one of the recipients was Doug Engelbart and the NLS system. And you should really watch his demo at the 1968 computer conference because that was the high watermark of his work. Somehow, magically, it was pulled off so that in San Francisco, miles and miles from Palo Alto where his computers were, by remote link in 1968, using an Ida-4 projector which used a windshield wiper wiping oil across a surface that a cathode ray tube beam would be hitting in a vacuum. I mean, this thing was insane. <clears throat> it's all on tape. Unfortunately, the version they've got up at Stanford has been cut into little bits. It should be consecutively available, and currently it is not. But you can see it, and it's, it's very moving, because the fact that it all worked is one of the great miracles of the 20th century. And it inspired everybody. From there, the story gets sad, because Doug lost his funding, and some Jasper talked, him, talked his boss out of Doug's office, and... Uh, things have gone downhill. Bob Taylor went to Xerox. Now, in 1973, Xerox was the apex. It was the Google of that day. Wildly successful, beyond their wildest dreams. Chester Carlson had demonstrated electrostatic copying in prototype in 1937. These patents were sold to a company called Haloid, which made photographic paper. Haloid put, I think, $50,000 a year into this project for 15 years. People sold their Haloid stock thinking, this is going nowhere, and then say, point to their front porch that they built with the money and said, that was my million dollars in Xerox, would have been my million dollars in Xerox stock. Because in 1962, Haloid changed its name to Xerox and brought out the 914 copier, which allowed people to copy things and it was revolutionary. I was in Miami at the time, and you had copy centers springing up. And you know, two middle-aged guys would rent one of these things, not knowing what would happen, and the lines would be around the block to make copies. No one had ever seen anything like it before. And uh, Xerox had a tax on everyone. I think they had like one cent per copy throughout the world. And uh, they thought the patents would never run out. <laughs> And they thought that, the, that the, uh, they would never be superseded by Japanese companies. But at any time, anyhow, they were swimming in money at this time. So they set up, some far-seeing guys at Xerox set up Xerox Palo Alto Research Center on the West Coast. They set it up on the West Coast because it was as far as possible from Xerox upper management. <laughs> this is what they say. And um, uh, not, not merely my own cynicism. And... Uh, Bob Taylor became head of this, or head of the computer branch. We don't hear much about the other branches. Xerox Park was a very big operation. What we see is what they created basically in the computer branch. And Xerox had been burnt on computers. They rashly bought a company called Scientific Data Systems, changed its name to Xerox Data Systems, said we're going to beat IBM in every department, named a department after each department at IBM, and proceeded to lose billions of dollars. So. <clears throat> they thought, well, we better stay away from computers. Now, what Taylor was going to do, he knew, would involve computers, but they weren't allowed to buy any. So they had to build them. They built them themselves. And uh, they built especially a small machine called the Alto. And this was everybody's dream. You see, here were us guys outside, starved for equipment, starved for anything. 
imagining what it would be like. And here, every one of them had a screen on the desk. They would, uh, Alan Kay, who was their uno unofficial ambassador, would go around saying, well, of course, we've got the top 10% of all computer science. Everybody else loved to hear that. <laughs> and, uh, and we have all these great computers, and we're using a language called Smalltalk, which is designed for children. <laughs> and <laughs> we laugh now, but we believed it then. <clears throat> and, um, and everybody was very envious. And a lot of things happened. So a, team, a bunch of people from Doug Engelbart's team the ones who were sharing ideas, sharing work on screens, went to Xerox Park and replicated the NLS system there. But competing with that was the influence of John W. Siebold with the fonts. And you see, Xerox was making laser printers, but the engineers would create the hardware and nobody knew how to hook it up to a computer. So they had to do that. So there were two main thrusts. Larry Tesler, I believe, encouraged Chuck Simone to create an editor for the screen, which is first called Bravo. It is now called Microsoft Word. And a guy named John Warnock created a system called Interpress, which was creating a common software interface for all these different printing machines that were coming out. And this was the Enterprise project, which is now called Adobe Acrobat. Now, the guys didn't actually steal the code. They went, they quit the companies and rebuilt their systems. But effectively, that's what happened. So Charles Simone went to Microsoft. Uh, so, pardon me, these two projects, Bravo and Interpress were based upon fonts and appearances. And the phrase they adopted was, what you see is what you get, which they abbreviated WYSIWYG. Now, according to one source I found on the net, that term, what you see is what you get, was actually from a comedian named Flip Wilson, who would portray a dame named Geraldine, on, a brassy dame named Geraldine on his show, and she would say, what you see is what you get. And uh, John Siebold, watching this TV show, said, ah, that's the concept I was trying to get across. And um, <laughs> he took that motto to Xerox, uh, Palo Alto Research Center, and that's what caught on. So Doug's stuff was ground into the dirt. <coughs> Serious text work was lost in favor of lipstick. Fonts are makeup as distinct from the tools that authors really need. Now, what about this guy? Well, here I was, and they didn't pay any attention. I spoke at Park, but they didn't pay any attention to my ideas. <clears throat> and the first leverage I got, or thought I was getting, was a project at Brown University called Hypertext Editing System, or HESS. And I walked into that thinking it would be a major implementation of my ideas, and, in fact, in fact, and found myself instead fighting with a lot of young programmers, A, who wanted to say, well, first you type in the name of the command, then you type in the parameters of the command. <laughs> See, they had, they had an IBM 360 with a graphic screen. That was, that was the big deal. But they had these outmoded ideas. So fighting them out of that and talking them out of that took a great deal of time. And finally, the whole system was dumbed down to one-way links branching from particular phrases in the text, which was very radical at the time. And I thought this would be temporary. Well, my, as my grandmother said, nothing endures like the temporary. And as far as I know, that the Hess system became copied as hypercard and note cards for the CIA done by, <laughs> done by Xerox Palo Alto Research Center and um, a number of others which I don't remember at the moment. 
and finally became the design of the World Wide Web. So if you, <coughs> I have a letter, I had a letter in New Scientist in 2006 apologizing for any part I may have had in the creation of the World Wide Web because it so violates what I believe in. And uh, in other words, we've, we've reduced hypertext to one-way links among rectangles <coughs> smothered with decorations and no serious ways to annotate, no serious ways to reuse content, no serious ways to bookmark, <coughs> all, in the, all lost in this format. So that is the story of text systems from my point of view. The uh, Park work, by the way, went on to the first, at Park they created, the Park User Interface, or PUI, which first appeared to the public as the Macintosh in 1984, and then went on to become Microsoft Windows and was copied by everything else. However, uh, Park had also created something called the Alto, which was a very, very expensive machine uh, for secretaries that no boss would buy his secretary because he'd rather spend the money on himself. <clears throat> of course, they spend that much now, but they do it in little pieces, so that doesn't seem like so much. <clears throat> I, uh, I don't know when I wrote this. Oh, darn it. Something's opening. I thought it would just go over to... Right. Okay, this was a... Um, this is just happens to be a, a note card that I wrote myself around uh, in the 60s, I guess. This is the top thing. The HT stands for hypertext. TML stands for terminology. And saying that structure politics is going to be the big thing. Well, is it ever? Because you see, document structure is political. Every major format has an interest group, has committees where they fight about what, should, what it should become. So that's, what, that's, that's our modern world now. But it's the, the structures are Adobe Acrobat and uh, Microsoft Word. Incidentally, so Microsoft Word was created by Chuck Simone. Some of you may know that uh, Richard Dawkins here is the Simone Professor of Biology. <laughs> he, got very, he, he did very well with that. <clears throat> And here is what today's specifications look like. <laughs> I'll tell you. Microsoft has announced, Microsoft in its beneficence, has announced that they're going to open the standard of their document into an XML-based format. And this is widely viewed with suspicion because parts of it aren't documented and are hidden inside Microsoft software. But the, uh, the line that's supposed to fool the public is it's now an open standard. This is the, no, is the current Microsoft standard just printed up. I got this from somebody on the web named uh, James Cox. <clears throat> so that's what, uh, what, that's what these things are like. So what of my Xanadu project? Well, first of all, where did it come from? Where did I get the title? In fact, oh, drat. Sorry, here it is. <clears throat> the original Xanadu is a real place. Many people think it's fictitious, uh, like Toyland or Shangri-La. No, here it is. It was the summer palace of the Emperor Kublai Khan about 300, uh, 300 kilometers north of Beijing. Here we see the, a, a large rectangle, a smaller rectangle, and the, and the outline of what once was the palace. And there we are, we're at Google Maps, and if we go smaller, one jump, two jumps, three jumps, four jumps, five jumps, and Beijing is there. So it's a real place, but why use it as a title of a, uh, why use it as the name of a product? Because it stands in English literature for the most magical place of literary memory. In Coleridge's poem, Kublai Khan, <clears throat> in 
In Xanadu did Kublai Khan a stately pleasure dome decree, where Alf the sacred river ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea, etc. <clears throat> this embraced a romantic vision. And uh, he, was, he got it from reading the account by Marco Polo of his travels to this actual place. So uh, <clears throat> I chose it. And oh, also, in the, in the writing of this poem, i kill that. In the writing of this poem, um, ah. in the writing of this poem, Coleridge said he was interrupted by a person from Porlock. Well, Porlock is somewhere in London now, but it was a town in those days. And uh, this person from Porlock bothered him for an hour, and of course he forgot the rest of the, po pro the, rest of the poem. Fortunately, it stands complete as it is. <coughs> and. Uh, so I thought of what I was trying to create is the magic place of literary memory where nothing is forgotten. And it's my registered trademark. People say, well, you know, it's also a trademark in other industries. There's Xanadu hotels, Xanadu uh, massage parlors, Xanadu clocks. But uh, I pay a certain amount of money to, to maintain it as a trademark for software. Now, what is it exactly? I can show you now. Shall I show it to you now? <clears throat> well, let me talk about some of the other adventures before I get back to Zan the Xanadu project. For a time, I, had, I was a partner in one of the first computer stores in Chicago. Here was the catalog we were selling boards for the S100 computer. This was in 1974, and I did this as a, <laughs> as a uh, uh, motto. The number of appalling circumstances I've, I've been through on this, trying to get leverage, trying to get backing, trying to get products out, always trying to get products out, has been horrendous. Um, I run into people, acquaintances in the computer field, who end up by saying, well, you're having fun. And this always pisses me off <laughs> to the skies, because I've had very little fun. <laughs> what, is, what I do is, has not been fun at all, but it is a, um, it, there's some kind of a, an ethos that you should act as if you're having fun. You should always act cool and act like you're having fun. So I encapsulated that in a song I wrote, which I can't find, but it's in somewhere in my notes, but uh, the punchline was a song called Bonnie and Clyde. You remember Bonnie and Clyde Barrow? Uh, would send snapshots of themselves to the press, taunting the police. They called it a game, and they ran till they died. And I ask, aren't we all just like Bonnie and Clyde? The Xanadu concept was a jumble of desiderata the things I wanted it to be. Don't need that. Bye. A jumble of desiderata. And in my first computer pro programming course, I actually tried to program it and said, gee, this is harder than I thought. Not the programming, but getting the concepts right. And I started going faster and faster. And I said, no, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> Go slow and get it right. Well, it took 20 years. It took 20 years to figure out. See, one of the, one of the key criteria for me was, okay, we're, we're designing the documents of the future, all right? What do you want a document to do? First of all, you want every quotation to be connected to its origin. What could be more obvious? It's not easy. And that's only part of it. You want to be able to reuse all content 
and you want to be able to overlay the whole with ever so many links and connections and overlays. Not non-overlapping links is on the web. So you can, you can have two links, but they're consecutive. They can't overlap. But you want to be able to have hundreds of overlapping links to represent all the real structures, OK? We want to represent what's what this is really about. We want to have it based upon the way we want to represent human thought in the most generalized documents, not limited. So it took 20 years to get the design right, and it's taking 27 more years so far to get it working with many false starts and collapses and crud. I could show you, here's the structure of it in a poster. See. The easiest way is to open that viewer and drop this into it. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's a poster I did about 1985, which is the most condensed statement of it. But rather than give you the theory, let's look at the actual structure. So here we are. Here's the latest version called Xanadu Space. And what I'm showing is a demo. It's not a product yet. And I don't know when it will be. But I live for it. <clears throat> While it's doing its thing, <clears throat> there we are. Okay. This is still the best looking version we have, uh, although it's a little, it's been several months old. So here we are in a, an 11 page hypertext in 3D. Now the 3D is not logically required, but it's very helpful. Oh, let's, let's fly through the connections. That's nice. With a fresher machine, this would, uh, be smoother. So you see that we can have a profusion of connections, but on the other hand, it's hard to follow them. And that's why we have two pages up front. That's what these guys are for. Oops. So these two pages up front, so I don't want to overshoot. Good. <clears throat> these two pages up front, are the current page, which is, has larger type, and a companion page. And with this method of presentation, we can show you one connection at a time, even though there are thousands of connections on top of each other. So right now, the connection we're seeing is between this transclusion quotation, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and its origin in Genesis of the King James translation. Now, <clears throat> there are two types of connection in the system. Links and transclusion, which is a vital distinction to make. Transclusion means the same content across document aversion boundaries. So quotation is an example of transclusion. Now, I mentioned Van Nevar Bush before and his uh, piece, As We Will Think, As We May Think. Everyone takes that as the origin of links. It's not. It's the origin of transclusions. <laughs> because each of, each of Bush's trails was the same content uh, put on the trail. This is a crucial distinction in the Xanadu world because the two are implemented in different ways. We can make the companion page into the current page. <coughs> and back again. We can go down to the next connection. Here we have Adam and Lilith immediately began to fight. Some, you've all heard of Adam and Eve. Some of you have heard of Adam and Lilith, but we won't get into that right now. <clears throat> so that's another transclusion. And now we get into the flinks. I, we're saying flinks rather than links for a very simple reason. Because if you say links now, people think you mean HTML links, and our links don't have any relationship to HTML links. 
our links float on top, flinks, floating links. <coughs> you can have as many of them on top of each other as you like, and they can be of many different types, and you can see both sides. So, any other questions? <laughs> so, uh, <coughs> so it's entirely different mechanism. And that's it. That's all this system will do as soon as we have it as a product, and which I hope is really soon. Now, they recently invented things called blogs and wikis. And all of that is just built into the Xanadu structure. It's just built in. So did we invent blogs and wikis? No. The web disinvented them. <laughs> they took out that capability, so, some, so it had to be reinvented as a separate mechanism. You see? All the different structures that, they, that are happening now, blogs and wikis and trackback and whatnot, <coughs> I don't know any, <laughs> or at least the ones, I'm, the ones I've seen lately, are all built into our structure. And yet the structure is incredibly simple because it's just the, the structure of the document is just two things. A list of contents and a list of overlays. That's all it is. Now, the specifics will kill you, of course. As, as the Quakers said, as the Shakers said, God is in the details. Uh, Recently, that has been uh, demonized to, into God. The devil is in the details. I prefer the original because if I'm an atheist, but I do believe that God is in the details. Mm, running out of time. <clears throat> to be a generalist is very expensive. There are pluses and there are minuses. If you're, a generalist is not an ordinary academic. An ordinary academic has a peer review group. A generalist does not. So the ordinary academic has as his conscience the peer review group. But the generalist is the conscience of everybody. Because we're trying to figure, each of us, trying to figure out how it all should be. Everybody's favorite generalist is Buckminster Fuller. He, uh, he designed three things. In the 30s, he, he designed a fabulous car. As I understand it, Toyota has basically gotten up to his specs recently in terms of uh, fuel efficiency. And unfortunately, one of the cars crashed in an accident, and uh, that gave it a bad name, and it was a bad time. And that went away. Then he designed the Demaxian House which was intended to be flown in and dropped on a spindle, flown in by helicopter. One prototype was built. That it was, worked wonderfully is proven by the fact that people lived in it happily for 20 years, and it's now a museum, I think, in Akron, Ohio. And then after those two, that didn't work, oh, that didn't work out because he fought with his board of managers, which, of course, that's the problem if you have a company. <laughs> his third design, the geodesic dome worked out extremely well because it was licensed by the Air Force for radar, and uh, he finally did all right in his latter days. And he would speak, he would always speak for five hours, or usually. No one would leave. It was marvelous. No one understood what he said, but it was great. <laughs> they created a special institute for Bucky. I always thought someone would do that for me, but nobody did. His was uh, at some rather obscure state college in Pennsylvania, but still. <clears throat> Another of my favorite generalists is the actress Hedy Lamarr. It is not generally known, oh, hey. it is not generally known that Hedy Lamarr invented spread spectrum cryptography <laughs> as a fiercely anti-Hitler German refugee in Hollywood with her husband, Georges Antel, the composer, they worked out the notion of a, of a program following cryptographic unit that would continually change the spectrum on which it broadcast. And uh, it had a little player piano in the patent application. Apparently, this threw off everybody because everybody laughed at it, and so it got no attention in World War II. But now you betcha, <laughs> now that the patent ex is expired, and, Hedy's movies are considered uh, classics. Uh, the uh, technique is well used. As far as generalists are concerned, my favorite character, excuse me, let me change my tape. 
my emergency tape. <coughs> The issue is seeing. And educated people lose the ability to see. If you mention a subject to somebody, you can tell they're educated if they say, oh, I don't know anything about that. I never took it. Whereas somebody who never took anything is more open to learning. There have been a number of times I've seen things that were important to me. I worked at Dr. Lilly's Dolphin Lab in Miami in the 19, early 60s. Dolphins are wonderful creatures. They've just found out they're basically descended from hippop hippopotami. Uh, whales are, dolphins. Very rubbery. We were working with the, uh, the inshore dolphin, the, the uh, gray Terciops truncatus, and we would pet them and swim with them and play with them. And um, they couldn't manipulate facial expressions. But were they expressive? You betcha. And other people in the lab couldn't see that. They couldn't see the expressiveness of the creatures, but the, 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 how the body language was, was talking all the time. And I just, I just wonder why they couldn't see it. One time, talking about seeing, one time, Early evening, I was in a mall in a small town in New Jersey, and I came to a place where there was a child photographer had set up his equipment, and he was trying to talk some parents and their child into having the children's, children's picture taken. And standing <laughs> nearby was a small elephant, about so tall, I think, young one. No one was paying any attention to the elephant. The elephant was just standing there in the most forlorn manner. I walked to a polite distance and said, hello, elephant. And she raised her trunk and swung it. And I thought I was going to be killed. She hugged me. <laughs> she had completely understood the spirit of my communication. Elephants see. I just read, I just came across a clipping in the, uh, after the tsunami, they brought in the elephants and they could find the bodies. Nobody knows how. One night late on the expressway in Chicago, I was heading home, and way behind me, thousands of feet behind me, I saw one other car, and it was headlights going like this. They were rocking. And I saw in an instant that it was a duster, a Dodge duster, quite like the one I was driving, out of control, and he didn't know he was out of control. So I pulled way over to the side and slowed down. This lunatic tore past me, spun out, and we ended up facing each other, stopped in my lane. So the precautionary, <laughs> the precaution was precisely well put, but I would have had no idea. It's just a matter of seeing what's in front of you. There's a lot more to say here, but you guys are really... I was going to talk about general schematics, my system of idea structures, but you know what? Even if, even if there were a lot of time, it wouldn't uh, <clears throat> be easy. Talk a bit about paradigms. Paradigms, everybody talks about paradigms. I went to a California workshop once. First question was, who here knows what paradigm means? Half the hands went up. Who here has heard of Thomas Kuhn? My hand went up. <coughs> uh, I didn't mention that I'd had dinner at his house recently. <coughs> Is, uh, I came to know him through the strangest means. I hung out with a com kids' computer club where, in fact, they knew more about technicalities than I did, and so I was learning from them. And one of them was a young lad named Kuhn who was 12, and 
uh, gave me some very good advice, and it turned out it was Tom Kuhn's son. I had dinner at their house, and they had a knitted sampler, a, a embroidered sampler on the wall saying, God bless my paradigm. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked Kuhn, you know, I had additional terminology for the enhancement of the concept of paradigms. And I asked uh, how he felt about that. He said, oh, do anything you want with it. I've run it into the ground already. <laughs> so paradigms have a life cycle. Uh, a new paradigm is born out of some new concept or maybe a piece of an old one. And it gets bushy. It gets loose. For example, Christianity in the first century supposedly was very loose. Very loose. They, they've, uh, I forget the name of the lady who's been studying it, but they've found a lot of old stuff in jars uh, from early feminist versions of Christianity from the first century. Then comes the lockdown, <laughs> uh, which happened with the uh, Council of Nicaea, where they decided what, where Constantine said, okay, it's time to simmer this empire down. Let's have one religion. It'll be Christianity. Uh, what is it? So hastily they had to figure out what Christianity was, and they came up with the, uh, uh, the Nicene Creed, which is uh, awfully strange. <clears throat> and then they had to revise that. And so that was the beginning of the Catholic Church, essentially. But now, uh, after Protestantism has run for a few centuries, and you have, and California is at full rate, you have New Age, hundred flowers Christianity, just the way it was back in the first century. So this is the paradigm cycle, part of it. And then, the, then there's the paradigm crash, which means that the paradigm can no longer, oh, the paradigm lock, which means that it can't move very often because there are too many specifics. Then the paradigm crash, where it all comes crashing down. An example would be Judaism at the diaspora. In the diaspora, the Romans, for it's not clear what reasons, threw the Jews out of uh, what was then Palestine. Or, and uh, the results are with us, the problems of that are with us yet. But Judaism became simplified. Before that, there was a priestly class and a whole lot of complications, and it became simplified to the Torah. Uh, the, uh, a rabbi is now just a wise man, and you need ten guys for a, ten guys to hold a service, and that's it, pretty much. And that new streamlined system, that, so we became the paradigm. So we may, we may call that paradigm neoteny. Neoteny is a term in biology when something new regrows out of a simpler form. And so these, so these are the cycles of the paradigm. It may be that we're in for a paradigm crash right now. Today, some major economic guy said, people should not panic, which of course <laughs> is the trigger for panic. So tomorrow or the next day may see the big slide. Let's open it. Another kind of paradigm is caring. The economists talk about utility as though your choices are some simple numerical thing, whereas in fact the package of someone's caring involves people and ideas and places and favorite foods and memories. And the process of paradigm crash there is called mourning when something important is lost. I'll sing a, I'll sing a little song about that. <clears throat> How you have ended it, seemingly glad, smugly disparaging all that we had. You who walked with me, leave me to crawl. The nullification of all. And all that you did, all that we did, and the love that we made. What we ate and we smoked, and the games that we played, and each conversation and call, voided and nullified all. 
For now you've decided it all was a fake. And I've no right to mourn you and no right to ache. No reason for sorrow or gall. The nullification of all. Your love was a scaffold I took for my use. Enjoying the view but ignoring the noose. What now do I ask as I fall? The nullification of all. A year has been lost, but it seems not a friend. God damn you and keep you, and this is the end. And this ballad shall finish. My wall. The nullification of all. I wanted to get that one in. I like it. So I'll close. Not intending, not so intending, I managed to leap into the most competitive fields in the world, movie making, software design, and philosophy. But I never thought I was competitive. I always thought I was just fighting for the truth. And uh, the right. I feel that I still am. I don't have a good segue for this. I'll just close with my most recent poem, which was just published in the Oxford Magazine. I held off putting it on the web for some time, or reciting it in public because paper editors don't like used poetry. <laughs> <laughs> so, dedicated to Marlene. Homing. The spermatozoan had little to go on, tunneling into the mist but a faraway flavor to seek and to savor of spices contrived for the tryst. Her chemical gradient, welcoming, radiant, summoned him to her embrace, just as something between us, some beacon of Venus, has beckoned me here to this place where you open for me, receive me, adore me. How hither came I, who can tell? Like each nano ancestor who, finding her, blessed her, I've followed so blindly, so well. Thank you. We have uh, a few minutes if there are some questions or. Responses, if you have it. Sure. It's all right. I, I was just wondering, um, I encountered Xanadu before the web existed, and, and I've been following it in one way or another ever since. It's very exciting. But w when I look at the web, what seems to, to, to explain its incredible fertility and its, its speed of growth and its size and its, and its variety seems to be precisely that Tim Berners-Lee excluded all that stuff about permission and uh, uh, about both sides of the link and so on. And what, what would we have had, what would have become of the web if he had included all that? <coughs> First of all, <laughs> if I'd had my way, it wouldn't have been a web. <laughs> it would have been something different. The, um, uh, First of all, I think while Tim is, well, what Tim did is important, not enough credit is given to uh, Bina and Andreessen who created the browser as we know it. So I think the web was defined, really, by two students at the University of Illinois. Uh, the reason it caught on is like karaoke. Everybody can do it. And the fact is that it was done um, very simply. But everybody I knew in the hypertext racket said, my god, that's crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, I remember that period, and, that, and, yeah. and they were all wrong. No, they were right. They were right, but they were wrong. <laughs> But the point is that, yeah, the embellishments well, the point is we now, have, we, now, we now have a bushy paradigm where there's all kinds of enhancements and complications built on the 
regrettable structure. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and uh, but there's always room for more formats. That's that's how I see it. Okay. Thank you. Is that it? Oh my goodness. Ah, good. Yes. Um, I don't know if I really need this that. is not a microphone, but <laughs> so that we can hear the question. Okay. Um, looking at the demo of uh, Xanadu, that page, which I have, I've never heard of it before, so mm -hmm. I'm c coming totally fresh. That's the new version. There have been a lot of versions. Um, reminds me of a little bit of something you may have been familiar with at your first job at the New York Times. I work at a newspaper, and when I started there, uh, type was sad. We had moved out from the hot type to cold type, but long strips of... Uh, of uh, Type came out with the things on it, and looking at your eleven pieces there reminded me of the type waxed and put on uh, on boards, you know, before the the printers cut them and and moved them around. I wondered how much of your waxed. I don't know about the oh, okay. Well, th this is how. Oh, I mean, you're talking about linotype, right? Linotype, right? Linotype. Yep. It's waxed and <clears throat> and and moved around. I'm wondering about the the sort of the inspiration for that that look of it uh, and also what exactly how it would work. I mean, do you see it? Is it a, is it a word processing type of thing? I mean, <clears throat> how would a, a writer, if you want to sort of capture literature and memory, how would a writer actually interact with it? You type in it. You type into it and you pull, for, you pull quotations. So that instead of having to, uh, you, you, pull the, you pull the quotations across from, from, from the source. And that, that beam then follows it to show where it came from. But, uh, but instead, of, instead of cut and paste, it's pull across. But yes, see, all these terms that came after my work, like word processing, <laughs> seem, are things that shouldn't have to exist independently. Having, it, it, having one simple system for everything seems to me the way to go. And uh, the Xanadu thing is to be, the Xanadu concept is to be to do the best you can for the content itself rather than the decorations. The decorations you can always put on top. But in that damn fool HTML thing, which I, we don't blame Tim for, he took, he took what was around, but mushing the type fonts and angle brackets into the content seems to me barbaric. Why not have them on the side? So they could, you can mark up the same content in more, than, more ways than one. So, that, uh, so have a clean data structure from which you can do much more. Oh. Yeah. In the back. <clears throat> One of the main um, threads in behind what you said um, relies on micropayments to make the whole um, the stream of remuneration actually work. Now, uh, micropayments have been attempted in many different ways. Um, if we were to go ahead with what you propose, we would need to solve the micropayments problem. Yes, well, if you look at my patent, so, I think I have. <laughs> okay, so, so is, that, is that the short answer? Um, well, that's, that, but but answer? the other part of it is, it's, uh, micropayments have been proposed for a much broader variety of things. And since I'm particularly concerned for content, uh, pictures and text and, and, and the like, uh, graphics, uh, movies, uh, the other generalities aren't required. And the other part of it is people's motivations go in general directions. You say a thing has been proposed by, sometimes it's proposed by committee, sometimes it's proposed by this guy. For instance, the, um, um, the one that digital equipment had, which has died now, was much more general and obviously well thought out, but, it, but differently angled. As I say, the computer field is so much a matter of, I mean, pardon me, there are areas where there is real technology. To build a submarine or an airplane takes very, very specific kinds of R&D. But software can be any damn thing, and it's based upon, as I said, passions and uh, fights and packaging and conventions. And those are the real, the real things. So, so what, is, uh, what is HTML? It's a, it's, a, it's a package. So many things that are called <coughs> Technology, such as Windows technology, web technology, they're not technology, they're packages. They're packages of conventions. And, 
uh, obviously they are, they are technical, but it is the decision of what to put in the package and how it should look, which is the heart of the thing, not the particulars. Uh, it's not as though it had any determinate force like the propulsive power of a propeller. If I could just also add to that, I mean, there was the convention, conventional wisdom years ago that micropayments just would not work. But, I mean, ringtones and other things have really changed the mindset now that they actually could, could actually, you know, I mean. But there's still big payments. Their minds. There's still big payments. Yep, I mean, yep. like several cents. Yep. <laughs> Max? Considering the limitations of the systems we use at the moment, what have you found to be the best way to organize your notes? They're no good one. No good way, whatever. <laughs> well, pardon me, <coughs> zigzag, which I didn't show you. The, um, as it happens, I believe I've discovered the correct generality of structure, generalization of structure, which the computer guys didn't discover for a very, pardon me, the more conventional computer scientists. I have now reluctantly admitted that I guess I'm a computer scientist. <coughs> but the reason the more conventional guys didn't discover it, is that they're looking under the street lights, okay? <laughs> they're looking, they're trying to solve, solve problems that are predefined, and they're looking in places they'd expect to find the answer. And that's not where you'll find anything new. So that uh, hyperthogonal structure, which I didn't have time to include today, is, uh, but you can download from xanadu.com slash zigzag, is a completely general structure in multiple dimensions that is remarkably simple once you understand it, and which I believe represents the database of the future. And as soon as we get that usable, and it's working but not good looking in our package, then, uh, then that will be the organizing structure I'll be using. You advocate remembering and taking extensive notes. Don't you think that sometimes it's good to be able to forget and even to the point of planning obsolescence in data structures? Uh, David Mary has just asked about the benefits of forgetting. And I say, well, you know, we all take different stands. And that's not my style. <laughs> uh, you had a question also? So you, you've talked about your backgrounds on the creative side, and it's clear that you've put a lot of effort into how people can create content documents, organize their thoughts. Maybe less so on the sharing side and how people use this and communicate with others, share information. I know you have the concepts of annotations and things like that, but have you addressed that as, as much as you have the creators? Uh, it's all built in. <laughs> as I see it. Okay. <clears throat> so here we are. Let's say you're creating a new document and you wish to use somebody else's content. You just stripe it and pull it over. We know where it came from. If, if there's no charge, there's no problem. Uh, but it retains, all quotations retain that umbilical to their origins. And that to me is, that's real sharing. Now to me that's a wiki. And uh, I should say that, however, that today's wikis are also in, insanely political, like Wikipedia is insanely political. Uh, my friend uh, Jason Scott compares it to a casino. Quiet, seemingly peaceful. <laughs> but if you knew what was going on in the background, you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't feel so comfortable. <clears throat> and uh, the, the, uh, they have fights between different editors whose scythes are of different lengths. The, there's one school of thought that says, you should have, just have as much there as people want to write. And the other school of thought says, no, no, it should only be the length that subject deserves. And, uh, and so these people are, uh, are tearing stuff out. Scott puts it this way, don't expect Wikipedia, a Wikipedia article to be any better five years from now. Than this. It'll be different. Don't expect it to be better. Okay. Yes. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say on that point. Isn't that the, the point about Wikipedia is that it's actually kind of like Xanadu, but it's shipped. 
I mean, that's really unkind, isn't it? But it's, it's, no, it's, isn't no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a publication site. Yeah. Oh, in fact, it's exactly like Xanadu in that each page is generated from the particular edit operations. It's the only one I know. That, and that is half of the, the original Xanadu set. So Wikipedia is half of Xanadu. I can quote you on that. No, 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 no. <laughs> half of the Xanadu, the original, half of the original Xanadu design, okay. without the overlay links, but but if you took, <clears throat> and without the generalization. So <laughs> our system in 1981 was much better than the one you see here because it was generalized for huge address spaces, and we've simplified it to local for now. So do you think you could overlay Xanadu on Wikipedia? It might be done. It's not what I'm going to do. That, no, that's, that's a different... Uh, that's a different uh, there are many strategies with regard to this whole thing. That's a different one. Thank you. That's fascinating. I think all, all of us at the OII have learned that we don't tell uh, Ted that it's like anything. <laughs> <laughs> but We've everything is like everything else. That's the point. Yes. <laughs> Nothing is unlike anything else. It's just that some things are more like things in different ways. <laughs> well, let's uh, close this formal part of the discussion, and we'll have a uh, reception uh, for everyone and, and informal discussion. Uh, Ted is no ordinary academic. He's shown you again this afternoon. Um, he's uh, truly, I mean, in the so in social scientists, I think, would call him an, a major actor in the history and future of computing, and uh, will always be. Uh, We've been really honored to have him at the OII for uh, several years. We hope to keep that connection. We wish Marlene and Ted all the luck in the world uh, and hope they'd stay in touch. And please stay around if you can uh, for some refreshments. Okay, thank you, Ted. Thank you.